Welcome to the 2020 Awards Podcast. Today we've asked our guest, costume designer Ron Lehman, to share with us what he believes is an example of great costume design. Ron invited us to sit down and revisit Schindler's List. I don't understand. <laughs> you want these people? These people. My people. I want my people. Who are you, Moses? Today we're joined by costume designer Ron Lehman. His resume includes works for both film and television, ABC, CBS, HBO, Hallmark Hall of Fame, and uh, a lot of strong commercial and theater credits. Some of his many credits are uh, Blue Velvet, Snow Falling on Cedars, and Little Buddha. Welcome back to the show, Ron. Thank you. So Schindler's List is a film about a businessman, Oscar Schindler, played by Liam Neeson, who is a Nazi party member during World War II. He eventually risks everything he has to save the lives of all of his Jewish workforce. The film was directed by Steven Spielberg, and costumes were done by Anna B. Shepard, who actually seems to have uh, a recurring workforce in World War II-themed films. <laughs> she does. She's also gone on to do Inglorious Bastards and The Pianist. So, uh, Ron, this is... Uh, I'm very interested to hear because why you chose this as, as a good example of costume design because generally when we think of costumes and we think of certainly award shows they tend to go to the very lavish period pieces lots of bright colors or something like Adam's Family that are just more sort of theatrical not only is this a lot of people sort of in looking clothes but it's a black and white movie and and they're just wearing Nazi uniforms well, they're good looking, not Nazi uniforms, though. But well, it's also, but it's also, when you're shooting in black and white, you also have to think about the colors that how they'll show up in the black and white. What great, great tonalities, um, because you could always put someone in a navy suit, and you're going to have no very, you're not going to have a variance with the patterns and with the different shades. I mean, that's the whole thing they learned uh, in the old talkie movies, the non-talkie movies that, you know, the black and white, you had to come up with different patterns or different right. shades of gray. Right. Um, I was reading that, like, green doesn't show up very well. No. It ends up going black. But it's also... Oh, it goes black. It's also, um, you know, you, you figure out texture, too. And, and this is just like looking at some of the, the stills through this. It's just like the textures that she ended up using were just amazing. And the uh, distressing of the garments were just, unbe- you know, to me were unbelievable. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as a war movie goes, it can show how they, you know, how bad they looked. But at the same time, the uniforms were so perfectly right on. Well, it's such a beautiful contrast between the two lives that these, these different people were living. And then you see Liam's clothes, I mean, through the... I mean, it was just... She really showed the wealth, but at the same time, um, the use of hats. I mean, I look at everything, it's like, wow. You know, you aren't trying to cover up anything, but the use of the hats were so correct. The period was so correct. Um, I mean, I actually love sitting through it for to look at it visually more than anything else. And the lighting helped with the you know, how it brings out the mm-hmm. different tonalities. Yeah. So that's the reason why I had, you know, I appreciate it as a film uh, for costumes. Right. No, I think, I mean, everything you say there, I think it's funny because like... Uh, you know, we tend to not see too many black and white films anymore. And so that is something that, that it's just because we don't, you know, it, you don't, nobody thinks like that anymore. Right. Nobody has to think about tonality versus color. It's just sort of like, oh, well, this person's red, this person wears green, this. Well. But it's just like, you know, you look at all the different fedoras, you look at all the different hats that you see in the background with all the extras. And you get this varying degree of, you know, I think that's where both the director and the DP came into play was, is that, oh my gosh, you know, black and white, you're not going to have all these black fedoras or dark fedoras, but you have this whole variance throughout the entire, the entire movie that was just so, I think, visually beautiful. Right. Um, you know, and, you know, you, you think about the, 
prop person in connection with the costume designer and saying, oh my God, those eyeglasses. You know, glasses played a huge portion in a World War II because um, during the Holocaust, it was, you know, you frames after frames after frames of all the victims. Right. Um, the, yeah, there's even know, a scene where they're dumping so, suitcases full of them. So I think that's where, you know, who, whoever thought it through did an amazing job. As far as, because I just look at all the textures mm -hmm. that she used in some of these stills, and it's just so amazing. There are a lot of different peer groups in the film. Mm -hmm. you've, got the, you've got the Nazi soldiers, you've got the Nazi party members, the business people, you've got the, the, the Jewish workforce, you've got the Auschwitz Jews, you've got the, the, before, the before they're brought into the labor camps, and everybody has a different look to them. Um, care to comment on that? <laughs> it's just, I mean, it, she did an amazing job. I mean, it's the 40s, and I think it really looks, she's done it to the, because I'm just going through these stills, and it's just yeah. like, it is, it's amazing that you, know, you put your little pocket square in. Um, the, all the furs, the women were yeah, wearing I mean, were beautiful. Yeah, it's just amazing, the, you know, the how it was shown, the variants. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, not the cabaret the movie didn't, but you know, <laughs> but it was totally different. Oh, yes, it a little was bit different. Totally different. Yeah. yeah. Um, but this was showing the the gritty, the dirty, um, the smoking, the you know, you got to see every element of it, and I think she did an amazing job. And I'm trying to remember who, you know, the Nazi uniforms were designed by uh, some famous French designer. Oh, were they really um, originally? You know, oh really? A French um, because they had Hitler had gone to France to uh, make sure that the uniforms looked really great. So um, well, that's the thing. I mean, I feel like that's something you can't say. But they did have the best uniforms. They have they're, amazing uh, uniforms. Amazing. Beautiful. Yeah. What's interesting? Uh, one of the things I noticed too is like, and I've seen this before, but for some reason it really kind of stood out in this movie when the German officers take off their uniforms, like when they unbutton their uniforms, they almost seem to, like, explode. Like, there's something about them that, uh -huh. like, they look like they are designed to be buttoned and be standing at attention or sitting at, at attention, you know, upright properly. It's like the smooth uniform. I mean, I, I uh, you know, it's like all the futuristic movies have always, uh, I think, um, followed the history of uniform to try to bring about that because it was so sleek it was so yeah um smooth i mean even in when you see any of the old war photos they're still smooth mm -hmm. i mean it doesn't matter oh yeah 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 yeah. and and it, you know they i don't know there's something there's almost something disappointing about like when they take off that coat or open it up it's almost usually just like a like a wife beater underneath right uh -huh. you know and you're sort of like no there must be like more so layers cool. of beautiful clothing under there it's like no it's just like something plain and basic and, and also they have the, the leather overcoats oh those that's are nice. just badass yeah there's also another well there's a, a lack of clothing is prominent in the film too you mm -hmm. know you've got you've got the the labor camps where they're stripped down a lot and you really notice like it's, it's very powerful when they're when people are without costume. Exactly. But that's part of the, the beauty of costume. It's the lack of <laughs> right, right. sometimes. Yeah. And even uh, Ray Fine's character, oh. there's a couple scenes where he's standing up on his balcony and he's got his, his top off. He's only wearing his pants and, mm -hmm. and uh, suspenders. And, and he's just like, he looks like an animal. You know, he looks like an ape. He's got this big gut. And, right. And he's just... He's, he's an animal. Yeah, he is. You know, but I mean, it, 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 it sort of, I think the costumes help. You know, it kind of, he's stripped down to just, this is who he is. He's just a man, and yet he's this horrible creature. Yeah, well, yeah, I think they did that. It's interesting how they did it, but yes. <laughs> what are you <laughs> saying? No, more. no, what are you no, at? no. It's just, I'm just like going through there, going, those, all those huge. Uh, crowd scenes were just unbelievable. Um, and then there's this one, which I think says it all, is that 
you know, when you're suffering, you're suffering. But look at Spielberg. He's like all bundled up <laughs> in the middle of winter and everybody else is bundled up, but not as bundled up as he is. Right, right. Well, pleasures of modern day, I guess. And not being in a labor camp. <laughs> well, they were all dressed in wool, too. So it was like... I liked um, Liam Neeson's his character, his suits, the beautiful silk suits. No, his suits. Those were all custom made for him, so. Well, they looked it. Yeah. And Ben Kingsley was, was amazing. I thought was great in it too. I mean, he's always that, that character. And he can always, but he's always been Kingsley too. Sometimes. Yeah. Except Gandhi. <laughs> There's some costumes. There's some costumes for now, sure. Now I was very upset when that won, for best costume. Gandhi. Yeah. I know we're getting a little off topic, but... No, we're talking about costumes. Whoa. But uh, to me, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Blade Runner, but I thought the costumes in Blade Runner were pretty amazing. They were. And... Uh, For that time, they were amazing. Yeah. And uh, and, it, and Gandhi took it, and I was like, yeah, but it's just guys in rags. <laughs> Appropriate rags. <laughs> I know. Well, that's something. I mean, I think that's... I, I love movies like, like I think some of the best costume and production design I've seen is is in the movie Election. Okay. <laughs> because this is another whole podcast. Because I hated Election. Did you? Everybody else around me loved it. Yeah. I couldn't watch it. I could not sit through it. But what'd you think of the costumes? And just everything about it, I just did not like. Okay. All right. But that's my. And maybe it was the humor that drove me away. I just, I was... I don't know what it was. But. I was impressed that they actually made him look like a teacher. Like, he really <sighs> looked like every teacher I've ever had in high school. You know, and, and so... So, bringing it back to this, it's like, I think, you know, to see... It's like, oh, these people look like they've been living in that clothes for months. And they but I think it's a, it, the, the concept of a costume designer is to... Uh, try to bring that period or whatever you're creating uh, as a a tool for those actors right to create and I think that certain periods um, the fit is what's going to either restrict you or give you the freedom and uh, there was in a conversation with three other costume designers were sitting there going gosh is there any actor that could pull off any period and do it and wear it well and present it well. And Robert Downey Jr. was the only person that we could come up with. Really? That really? could actually wear the clothes um, and not complain and actually pull it off and wear them. And you really think of all the periods he's been through. And you go, yeah, he has. He hmm. can really get into it. This is like most of the female, ac- the female actors have a problem because... You know, of course, we're we're in a whole new world than say the 1700s, where shoulders were so narrow. Yeah, and you basically forced your body to conform to these garments. Right. Um, so when you put a contemporary individual into a 1700s garment, or you put him into a 1940s uh, full-length wool. Uh, guards coat from the Nazi era um, they're, they're going to go God the weight of this is so horrible or you know I can't my shoulders I can't move I can't act so you, <laughs> so you basically you you find the the medium part and I think that's what with Schindler's List is there's a lot of weight there on a lot of these clothes I mean it wasn't especially with the the, the military the Nazis it's like those uniforms aren't the most comfortable. And if you put a wool coat on and wear it, granted it was probably outside in the winter and they probably appreciated it, but at the same time, the weight of it was. Yeah. So, yeah, you can make any character you want to. You can help any actor, I should say, with their character, but I think it's them pulling it off and selling it. Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I know when I put on a suit, which is rare, it's like, you know, you, you tend to straighten up and, 
you know. But I mean, you, you look at seventies movies, and the hairstyles and everything look like seventies movies. It's just like you look Schindler's List, nineteen ninety three, and you go, um, they look like they're forties. Yeah, uh, not one of those, not one of the women, not one of them, uh, have contemporary hair, um, and because they didn't want their hair cut, because they had another movie to go on to. Right. Um, the, there was not the fear of it. And in the 70s, no one really cared. You know, it was just like, oh, 1940s, well, we'll just keep you in that blonde, <laughs> right. blonde, <Sting>. blonde <laughs> yeah. hair color. You know, so there's, I think that's the concentration that you see over that's happened over the years with costume design is that you really concentrate on uh, the period and the hair colors. I mean, it's just like, you know, something's playing in 2010, I mean, the movie 2010 or uh, that you end up going, what's futuristic? Mm -hmm. Um, What's the hair color is going to be for that, you know, that era or that future? So you really have to think it through. And I think that's where um, a lot of these movies for that year really thought it well. And I think that's where it was the beginning, the beginning point. That's where I, you know, I applaud Schindler's List because I think they succeeded. You felt like... You were there. It looked like. Yes, I was there. <laughs> I was <sort> of, <laughs> it was. But it, it looks like it, didn't, it, didn't, it and... didn't look like anything that was contemporary. No, there was not a contemporary yeah. element yeah. in anything. I sat there, right, and watched, and that's what I applaud. Well, speaking of contemporary, we got to pay our bills. Oh yeah. So, our sponsors today are Honest Tea and Hilliard's Beer. Honest tea. Nature made it right. We put it in a bottle. Refreshingly honest. Honest tea. Visit honesttea.com to find a distributor near you. And Hilliard's Beer, brewed and canned in Seattle's Ballard neighborhood, but drunk everywhere by everyone. Visit their tap room Thursday through Sunday. You can get more info on them at hilliardsbeer.com. Can you believe this? As if I don't have enough to do, they come up with this. I have to find every rack. Bury that here and burn it. The party's over, Oscar. They're closing us down, sending everybody to Auschwitz. What? I don't know. As soon as I can arrange the shipments, maybe 30, 40 days, that would be fun. Okay. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. The girl in the red coat. Uh. This seems to be a bone of contention. It seems to polarize people. What is, uh, if, if you haven't seen the movie, basically the movie's black and white at one point during the uh, um, liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, we see Schindler is up on a hilltop and he sees a little girl walking through the crowd and she's, she's wearing this bright red coat. And it's the only color really in the film except for... There is a scene later on where they, um, they have to exhume all of these bodies and then and burn them and... Um, once again, we see the, the little girl in the red coat go by. Your thoughts on this? I have no thoughts. I mean, it was just it's, it's, <laughs> no. It's just symbolism. Um, and why would they do the red coat? Like why? Yeah. I have no. I, you know, it was just a symbolic of of um, of the vulnerability, but also the blood color. I mean, it's. Because you, you see all this death here and you never see the blood. Right. And so all of a sudden, this is um, representative of the blood because it's the only time you can show the red. Do you know what I'm saying? It, no, I know I, what you're saying. I'm, I'm, but I have no... Um, I have no thoughts other than it was a nice red. <laughs> it was a because nice red. The other thing, too, is if you try to get a red... You know, if you try to pinpoint one particular element and it's in black and white red is going to go black Mm -hmm. so how are you going to do it with all the other black and whites oh sure yeah yeah yeah. but i don't think that you know yeah there was symbolic of the little girl um i just (laughs) i have have really (laughs) that was a great coat uh I guess what it, were you trying to what are no, you trying to get No no, no it's, it's like I said it seems to be it seems to be like a, a moment that kind of like really people 
I'm guessing, Lee, I'm going to guess you did not like that. No, I thought it was silly. Okay. That's what all I was asking. What? Oh, was no, your... I just... I thought it was necessary and unnecessary. And maybe in Spielberg's eyes it was necessary. Did you think it was necessary? Um, not necessarily so. I'm not, necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily? Not necessarily. <laughs> so it was not necessarily necessary. No, I just necessary. don't think it was necessary. Because I think you saw... Yeah. I, I think there was no need for it because you saw all the death and... Yeah, that's what I felt. All the life destruction. Yeah. I just think... Stephen just wanted to throw it in. Uh, I, I agree. It was distracting. Yeah, I thought so too. He was like, whoa, wait a second. I think he was trying to wake up people. It's <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> um, now, I had also read that they had actually gone through and, and bought a lot of clothes from survivors. They did, yes. That's pretty intense. Especially if you were the family of the survivors, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, and that's what they, um, on the, uh, the back lot of Universal by his place, they were cataloging a lot of the people would give clothes to a museum. And he, I think at that point, the Holocaust Museum hadn't been completely started. So he had a whole group of students cataloging um, not only um, interviews, but also articles yeah of survivors so do you think maybe he had all this clothes and it was like hey we can make a movie no (laughs) no i don't think it's that no no. um so yeah i mean there's a ton of characters in this movie i mean just bodies what's 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 the largest amount of cast you've ever had to clothe um one of my first movies i was hired as a costumer uh, and I was mainly hired to watch Mickey work. It was a year of the dragon. No, well, wait, before we go on. So, I'll, I'll, so well, largest what's group. the difference between a costumer and a, and a okay. wardrobe designer? Here's the hierarchy. Costume designer, and then you have a costume designer's assistant or assistant costume designer. Then you go down some half sketch artist. Then you have supervisor. Then you have key costumers. Sometimes of a huge movie, you have a male and female key costumer. Then you have additional set costumers. Um, and sometimes stars have their own personal costumers. Uh, okay. Slash dressers. Um, I think over in, in uh, England, they have personal dressers just to um, take the clothes on and off. But here, um, you just go down through all the different uh, costumers, and then... Okay, so you were a costumer. I was a costumer, and I was specifically hired... What what does that entail? um, Well, I was hired to do Mickey work just to make sure all of his clothes were set out and that everything was ready for him. Then I ended up going, you know, in a short amount of time because uh, Michael Cimino like to fire people on the spot. So I would go shift, I would shift (laughs) around quite a bit, but, um, but we had that huge scene in the movie, um, with the, um, the funeral and we had all the, the police, uh, New York city police department. And then we would have these huge scenes. I think there was a Chinese funeral, um, which was massive in itself. So I would say anywhere from 500 to 1,000 people, oh, okay. you would wardrobe. And I just know that we had, they had brought a lot of people down from New York for, there was the gambling scenes, and they bust loads of people down because you're in Wilmington, North Carolina, and where do you find, you know, 500 Chinese or Asian uh, people? So they bust them in from all over. Um, but the gambling scenes, they would bus in the gamblers from New York City. But um, but the thing is that you know you're you're sitting there and you have to. This was not the era of the clip ties. This was the era of the you had to stand there and tie ties yeah. on all these people. So you know when 500 in dress, uh, 500 police officers in dress uniforms, you're standing there for two hours just tying ties the entire right. time. Um, but again, you know, you have to dress each and every one of these extras. So you probably have um, four or five costumers just handling 
the female portion. Right. Then you have four or five costumers handling the male portion. Um, that doesn't we, seem like enough. No, it doesn't. But at the same time, if you've got it organized well enough. Uh, some of them have up to ten people to help wow. get these people dressed. But if if you got it planned enough, you can just hand close to them. Yeah. Uh, for period. Mm-hmm. But you also have to consider that you have to do prefits on some of these people too. Um, and films nowadays they don't have the prefit times budgeted in. So basically, if it's a period film, you hope that you have the clothes when these people arrive, and um, you know you, you get their sizes ahead of time. You try right. to preset it, pre poll, and based on their sizes they give you. But it's it's a huge process, and you know your call is usually four hours before shooting time because you have to get all these people dressed. Yeah. And that was a lot of people. And I don't think he CGI'd in too many of those background people. I think it was all... Oh, no, I think they're all... They're all real. Yeah. And so, you know, it's it, it's like Prefontaine, the 60s. This is like, we're not going to fill the Husky Stadium <laughs> to look like the Olympics. Yeah. Um, so they ended up getting cutouts. Oh, of, right. Uh, body cutouts just yeah. to put up in the stadium. At a certain point, and then you start dressing people yeah. for that period. But it's it's a venture. I mean, I'm I applaud anybody that can do it. Yeah. I, I mean, the reason why I picked Schindler's List because I really was amazed at um, how it was texturally and, and perfectly done as far as the period goes. There may be a lot of people out there arguing about it, but I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think they're arguing about the costumes or just about the movie? <laughs> I think it's a, well, people could argue about the costumes, but I think she was right on. I mean, it's yeah. just, um, you know, and a lot of people go, well, you can't go wrong with World War II. <laughs> <laughs> World War II Nazis. But at the same time, you could. You there could, are certain yeah. things yeah. that you know those uniforms well. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure... Well, I noticed that, that you know they have those weird little ribbons on the right, buttons. Right, come up in the. But I noticed, like you know, one guy's goes one way, another's goes a different way. They, they I mean, even those little details. It's like uh, kimonos wrapping, o, you know, oh. folding which way and right. you know, OBs and all that. You have to know these things, and yeah. if you don't, and sometimes you have military advisors on that will advise you, but if it's someone from the you know, from the 40s, advising you. Um, with the U.S. Army and military, they had so many, you know, units that said, no, we're going to do it this way. So you have to have, like, someone from each unit, meaning from each unit of the Army, each unit of... Because, you know, you can get someone going, no, 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 those ribbons should be uh, this way, this way, this way. And then all of a sudden you get someone that actually wore that uniform and goes... Uh, you've got those ribbons all wrong. <laughs> so you have to really make sure your advisor knows what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, and I know the research that, you know, with, especially with Schindler's List, they had like a year to prep it. Sure. For research purposes, so. Well, you kind of need it. It helps, but movies nowadays, you don't, you don't get that. Yeah. Well, now they fix everything with like CGI. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, they fix that ribbon? Yeah. Oh, that ribbon should have an extra thing on it. Oh, okay. okay it's going to be a different color. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, Ron. Um, I'm really glad you picked this. Just honestly, because it is, it's, it's, it kind of goes opposite of what, what we tend to generally think of when we think of costume design. and It's a little, a little more natural looking. <laughs> so. It is. Um, did you get a Twitter account yet? Not yet. No? All right, well. You're going to help me. We'll try and get that set up. Uh, Once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Honest Tea and Hilliard's Beer. If you're a movie lover and would like to support us, you can subscribe to the 2020 Film Club. Your annual subscription gets you into our monthly four-year consideration screenings here in Seattle, plus a ticket to our annual ceremony in February. Uh, It's over $100 value for only $40. To enroll, just visit us at 2020awards.org and look for the subscriber link. Until next time, remember, it's never too late to start thinking about the past.